the New York Association on Independent Living, speaking with Bob Goodson, author of In Blind Sight. Could you briefly introduce yourself to people that might not know you already? Sure. Hi, I'm Bob Gumson. Hi, everybody who knows me. And for those of you who don't, um, I was the manager of independent living services at State Ed for 25 years from 1992 to 2017. I worked with all the independent living centers all throughout New York State. Um, I watched the program grow from um, a period of time where we were serving nearly only 36,000 people in the state to well over 100 to 200,000 people being served. It was touching a lot of people's lives. Um, during my 25 years with State Ed, I worked very hard to help the Independent Living Center program connect with other um, agencies throughout the state of New York um, to really diversify and grow the base of consumers that we served. Um, we really became truly cross disability over those years, entering into some strong relationships with fellow advocates and peers in the mental health community, the DD community, um, people with brain injury, um, uh, a lot of other diverse ethnic groups, minority groups, um, uh, American Indians in New York State. Um, we even began to serve migrant farm camp work campers. Um, that came here from other countries to pick our fruits and vegetables. Um, we uh, took all kinds of measures to categorize and keep a focus on bringing about community and systems change. If I had to say what one of the things I'm the proudest of in uh, my 25 years was really bringing an attention to the role independent living centers played as their community and throughout New York State at every level in every aspect of life from voting to education to employment to social and recreational pursuits. Um, right across the spectrum and particularly also in healthcare delivery. Um, during my time with the state, we began seeing waiver programs uh, take shape, including um, the brain injury waiver and the role centers had in that and the nursing home um, transition and diversion waiver, which independent living centers set um, the groundwork for and really broke ground. Um, we worked very closely back then with the DDPC to demonstrate how centers can play a pivotal role in transition people, transitioning people out of nursing homes and other congregate care facilities. I'll say I'm a native New Yorker. I was born and raised in Brooklyn. My life has taken me um, from Brooklyn to college in Binghamton grad school and then 15 years of work and family life in the Boston, greater Boston area. And then back to New York in 1992, I have eight children, including three of my own and five that are step from my wife, Pat. Um, those five children of hers have 11 grandchildren and we're spread wide and, 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 and far. Um, our son and daughter-in-law with three grandkids live in Ireland, and my oldest daughter these days lives in China. So we um, are very busy with our family. We live in Albany, and we winter for several months on a little island on the west coast of Florida called Anna Maria Island. Why did you decide to write this book? My decision to write the book came out of a variety of places. I had, I, I've always written throughout my life. Even as a little kid, I wrote poetry. Throughout my life, I've written 
uh, memoir-ish or memoir stories about things that were happening to me as life went along. I banked a lot of those and just left them on my computer. Some of them I had brailed out and had old copies of. I kind of remember taking an adult ed course when I was about 20 something at the um, Cambridge, Massachusetts Adult Ed Center, where we wrote a variety of stories about uh, things that happened in our lives. And um, I guess I've always wanted to write a book. I never felt 100% compelled to say that if I didn't write a book, I would have felt like I failed in my life, but everything sort of aligned over the past four and a half, five years. I found a memoir writing group here in the capital region that I joined back in um, 2016. And each month we write a uh, piece that's no more than a thousand words and we bring it, to, we come together, we listen to each other's stories and give constructive feedback. And I was, I was starting to collect a variety of stories. And then last winter during lockdown of COVID, um, I kind of set my mind to finding a Cracker Jack editor to really help me because I had no clue on how to um, put all my writings together. I was uh, concerned about, you know, just finding my voice and the grammar correct uh, correctly. So uh, through a contact I had as a neighbor years ago with Paul Grondel, who is now the, uh, the head of the New York Writers Institute, he referred me to an editor from who was a chief editor at the Times Union until he retired. And I worked with Rob Brill all through the winter, and he encouraged me to pull out old stories, revise them. Um, he kept on telling me I'm missing pieces of the, the lifelong adventure, um, write a piece about this. We'd talk and we'd become friendly over time and we'd share each other's lives. So he would say, oh, I love that story. Now go back and write more about that. So before I knew it, I had enough material for a book and he helped me bring it, um, bring it to life. I, I, um, I'm, I'm kind of amazed myself that, that it really did happen. And I, I, I hope you get to read it and enjoy it too. Is there a central theme in this book? I'd have to say yes, um, but it's individualized. Overall, my goal was to demonstrate through all of the various adventures I had, people I met, key um, uh, role models in my life, um, demonstrate how blindness and vision loss uh, becomes more or less just an everyday fact in life rather than um, a burden to overcome or um, an obstacle to um, moving on and, and, and taking risks and, um, and coming out on the other side. Um, anybody who reads my book might say a couple of things right, right um, after they've, they've finished even half of it. How the heck did this guy remember everything that I remembered? And I mean, in my life, being blind forced me to remember and keep my mind focused and use my memory a lot. My, I, I'd have to say I, I, I pride myself on having a darn good memory and, and that has helped me through my career and it helped me put this book and my story together. So theme wise, it, it's taking blindness through the various um, routines of life that become 
um, only consequential in the storytelling because I am blind. Some of the stories I don't think would have all that much zip or um, all that much uh, magic to them if the person going through the um, activities wasn't blind. Um, things happen. People with disabilities know this, especially people with any kind of physical disabilities. Reactions to the disability, uh, the, the, the various um, messages we get from other folks about our disabilities, um, the publicness sometimes of our disabilities. It's all there in my book. It's all there through the stories of my life. You worked for 25 years managing New York's Independent Living Center program. How did you end up working independent living? Do you have any words of wisdom for people working in independent living today? It's been an honor to have been the manager of independent living services for all those years in New York State and to have worked on behalf of all the consumers and the staff, boards, and so forth of, of our center. I want to be very clear about that, that I feel blessed and it was an honor. Um, I got introduced to independent living through uh, originally a career in vocational rehab. I went to grad school um, in Massachusetts at Boston University. My book has a lot more detail and I, I won't get into every aspect of it, but while I worked in the local district office that I was in, in Brookline, Massachusetts, a statewide unit that served in a much smaller state like Massachusetts, you can have a unit that serves people with spinal cord injury. And the, this couple of staff went around the state and met with people who were newly injured for, with spinal cord injuries at any hospital or rehab facility. And I got to know them because they were staff in our office in Brookline. And right around the time of 1978, when the Rehabilitation Act created an independent living component in the federal law, um, the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission, which is a standalone state agency that included the disability determination services for SSI and DI, it included voc rehab, and it included also um, commission on the, uh, it, it included um, personal care assistance program um, as well as home care. Um, they were developing an independent living branch. So the first people that would naturally be recruited to host it and run it were folks from the spinal cord injury. And they recruited me out of the district office into the central office to run a program, a statewide program, where some of the funds from the Federal Rehab Act were being used and given to independent living centers to help people at risk of institutionalization or who were institutionalized to help them get out or prevent an institutional placement. That was often done with the purchase of equipment or trial basis for trying a personal care um, uh, program for a while, um, stair glides, ramps, things that you just can't get other ways um, that would allow people to stay home or go back home. So I ran that program in Massachusetts um, and worked with the centers there for, oh, maybe about six years before the job opening came up in New York. Um, and that's kind of through my professional career, how I got and found my way into independent living. But I did actually um, start even earlier than that. Um, I don't know if it was um, just a matter of um, chance or something about um, uh, a trajectory that I was uh, destined to be on. But back as a kid, when my friends in Brooklyn would start getting jobs as teenagers and going out um, uh, delivering uh, pizzas or, or, or working for a drugstore and doing some retail, taking tickets at the movie theater, those were jobs that they weren't going to hire a blind person for. So 
one summer, it was I was 19, um, my parents saw an ad in the paper, um, the New York City Mayor's Office on Handicapped Affairs, it was called back then, was going to have a summer employment program for people with disabilities. And I got hired as part of the staff. I went out to um, the various places where people were placed in jobs for the summer to make sure that they were working out to collect their time cards, to talk with their supervisor and troubleshoot any problems that happened on their jobs. And then in the next summer, 75, this is 74 and 75, I was working uh, in the Mayor Beam administration at the time. Um, 75, I was um, one of the key staff that um, did basically the recruitment of uh, youth for jobs and um, and and locations for employment. And um, I worked in the main office um, for the mayor's office that year in the summer. So kind of even while I was in college, even though I studied political science and sociology, um, I, I kind of got my feet wet in employment services for people with disabilities. Can you tell us more about the term advocrat that you talk about in your book? Or an advocrat is somebody who works to advocate from within, um, within bureaucracies. There is no doubt that state ed is a humongous bureaucracy. It's frankly not the most appropriate place for an independent living program or even a vocational rehabilitation program to be in. Um, going back to my Massachusetts days, um, I was sold on the fact that um, in order for dis disability services of all kinds to really get heard, they can't be lost in a gigantic um, I, I, the ivory tower of, of, of issues. And I mean, state ed is one of the biggest um, conglomerations of programs and services from cultural ed and bilingual services and GED and K through 12 and colleges and just name it. Where, where does independent living fit there? It's a stepchild to a stepchild. And you read about that a bit in the book as you get into the uh, closer to the end. And I give my perspective on um, how it was that I feel I made a difference. And um, in, in, in making a difference, it was not easy at times to be the um, advocate, bureaucrat within the agency with the disability, who is often at the table as the only voice of a person with a disability. Um, and, and, and you'd think that an agency that served people with disabilities over time would grow in their um, sensibilities about um, needs and, and, and issues of people with disability, but it, re it, it really didn't. I mean, there were so many times I could, I could point to things, I'll, I'll name two quick ones. One is how many times over the years, even with a production braille printer, did I go to a meeting and handouts came in print? No one would have the decency the time, the patience, the wherewithal to put um, minutes uh, or, or previous meetings or a handout of the agenda in Braille for me. Um, I had to stand on my head. And one time I came to a meeting, I actually brought, it was a small meeting, only about eight people. I brought eight copies of the agenda in Braille and handed them out, let people uh, get a feel of what it was like to sit at the table when print came to my hands. And the other thing I'll, I'll bring up was even a more relevant issue that still um, is a passion of mine these days. Back when um, the regents had asked special ed to revise all the teaching standards for all 
Um, it wasn't just special ed, but we were connected to special ed, all of education to deal with the pedagogical changes in education. I was at the table when special ed was examining all of their various teaching roles. And one of the ones that came up to my attention was, to this day, many people don't know this, but teachers of the blind and visually impaired do not need to know Braille. That is why most blind people don't know Braille. And it's a researched fact that only 30% of blind people are employed. And among those 30% that do work, 85% of them read Braille. You'd think that it would be critical for blind, uh, for teachers of the blind to teach visually impaired and people who are losing their vision. You'd think they'd want to teach Braille. But I sat at the table, I argued, I almost stood on my head to create a three credit course that all teachers of the blind mandatorily had to take. I, I couldn't get their attention. Uh, it's still to this day, There's, it's not a requirement. So those can give you, that can give you some ideas of the day in the life of an advocate working inside the system. Um, it's important to have your advocates inside the system. What do you hope people take away after reading this book? I hope people that read my book will realize that everybody has a story worth telling. Maybe it'll encourage people to write their story, every story. I, I'm not the most uh, famous, relevant, memorable person in the world, but I have a story. And I was led to see that for myself through the process of writing it and um, and and developing it over years, and then particularly setting it into a book format last winter. Um, I love reading stories. I was always a storyteller. I guess another reason that I have this book, going back to my own childhood in Brooklyn with all my friends, that you'll read about all my colorful friends that um, well, had an influence on me for better and for worse. Um, I did not always engage in activities that were, um, I, I'd say, uh, you know, on the mainstream. Um, but they always told me that I told great stories. They always came to me with their problems. So maybe that's also why I got early on into counseling as a profession. So between my storytelling and counseling, um, you know, I, I, I guess I'll tell, uh, I tell people, uh, go with your passion, um, join a writing group. Um, if you're in the capital region, we look for members in the Hudson Valley writing, memoir writing group from time to time. The Hudson Valley Writers Guild has a newsletter. And when we have openings, we look for people. I, I never thought I'd really have a book and I do. And, and you can too. Um, I know you can. Um, and I'd love to read it also. And I do hope you'll read my book. It's, um, it's in blind sight from Canarsie, Brooklyn, with love, music, and mischief. I'll say emphasis on the mischief. Um, and if you go to amazon.com, it can be obtained in paperback. Uh, you just need to put Bob Gumson in and it would come up. It's also available on Kindle. 